The British arts and crafts movement of the late 19th century grew out of the artistic and social activism of John Ruskin and William Morris, who exposed the detrimental effects of industrialization on both art and the lives of workers. John Ruskin was a respected art critic, polymath, and social visionary who became the first professor of art history at Oxford in 1869. William Morris had a more hands-on approach to revolutionizing the applied arts, learning and reviving traditional practices in stained glass, tapestry weaving, printing, and natural textile dyes in his Morris and Company workshops. Both men decried the shoddy nature of factory-produced wares that flooded the already over-decorated parlors of the Victorian period and called for a re-evaluation of what truly constituted a beautiful home. In his now famous dictum, Morris asked, what else can we do to help to educate ourselves and others in the path of art, to be on the road to attaining an art made by the people and for the people as a joy to the maker and the user? Believe me, if we want art to begin at home as it must, if you want a golden rule that will fit everybody, this is it. Have nothing in your houses that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. Overlooking the River Thames in London's borough of Hammersmith is Kelmscott House, the London home of William Morris from 1878 until his death in 1896. Part of the house remains open today as the William Morris Society and Museum. Curator Helen Ellitson explains the lasting appeal of William Morris. Well, well Morris himself um, influenced a wide variety of people. I think because Morris was so wide-ranging, it's not just the arts and crafts, but other people, book designers, typographers, uh, environmentalists, socialists have been inspired by him, you know, right up to now, to this day. His legacy really does live on in many different people um, in, in their work and lives. And I think what's interesting is there's quite a lot um, happening now in the way of like exhibitions, Fiona McCarthy's exhibition and the National Portrait coming up and that I believe goes up to the 1950s showing how Morris started uh, with the Arts and Crafts movement and the legacy was built on um, afterwards and I think what's so important about Morris is that um, he what he believed in sort of shines through in the products that he made and I think people have really taken that message to heart and the idea that you have beautiful things in your home that would impact and have a really profound influence on your quality of life. And I think a lot of designers to this day are looking at Morris and trying to do that. You can, and um, they're again going away from what Morris believed. He hated the, the Industrial Revolution, the factory system, and the way that designer and maker were divorced. There was no link there. And I think contemporary people today are trying to, to do put Morris's ideas back into practice again and designing and making the things themselves, uh, which is really interesting. I think Morris would be pleased to see that his work lives on to this day. Ruskin and Morris critiqued the division of labor in factory production lines as dividing the souls of the men, women, and children who worked them. They went on to spearhead social movements to improve the working and living conditions of the lower classes. In 1871, Ruskin formed what would become the Guild of St. George, promoting art education and craft work to revive rural economies and challenge the model of unchecked industrial capitalism. William Morris had already established a guild system with shared profits at his Merton Abbey workshops, producing decorative arts for Morris and Company. The ideals of both men took root and became a movement in the early 1880s, first with the formation of the Century Guild in 1882, led by the architect and designer Arthur Haygate McMurdo. The Century Guild published an influential quarterly magazine, The Hobby Horse, which combined modern painting and design with literature. A group of young London-based architects founded the Art Workers Guild in 1884, whose aim was to bridge the traditional divisions between artists, architects, designers, and craftsmen. Uniting designers and artisans from a broad range of the applied arts, together they challenged the Royal Academy's preferencing of the so-called high arts, in which painting was elevated above all others. Prior to the Renaissance, this hierarchy did not exist in the same way, and the high work standards of woodcarvers, stonemasons, and illuminators was not relegated below that of painters. Social reform projects arose to counter appalling conditions of poverty, such as Toynbee Hall, which opened in 1885 in London's poorer East End. 
part of the university extension movement, it gave Oxford and Cambridge graduates like C.R. Ashby access to the local community. Here, art would be a driving force in reform, and Ashby would go on to train East End Cockneys in the traditional arts of wood carving, metalwork, and blacksmithing to found his Guild of Handicraft in 1888. Also in 1888, the Arts and Crafts movement coalesced around the formation of the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society, including designers, makers, and manufacturers. Their credo was that art is or should be an agent in the production of noble life. Society exhibitions began in 1888 and continued annually for three years, and then every three years thereafter. The exhibitions featured lectures and demonstrations given by its leading designers, such as William Morris, shown here at the Loom, lecturing on traditional weaving techniques and sketched by his friend, the artist Edward Byrne Jones. In 1893, the Society published an important series of essays by their most prominent masters in the British applied arts, which laid out standards of excellence in their respective fields, including woodworking, stained glass, ceramics, metalwork, textiles, and the publishing arts of manuscripts, bookbinding, and printing. While the movement had mainly begun in London in the 1880s, in the following decade it spread to Britain's industrial cities. Art workers guilds and schools teaching the applied arts became active throughout the nation, including the Central School of Arts and Crafts in London, the Birmingham School of Art, the Keswick School of Industrial Art, and others in Manchester, Liverpool, and Glasgow. The arts and crafts design aesthetic can initially be difficult to pinpoint as the range of the applied arts it impacted is so broad. However, common to the diversity of work media was an ideal of truth to materials, clean functional designs that allowed the natural beauty of the components to shine through and not be dominated by unnecessary ornamentation or surface treatment. Furniture, for example, was constructed from native woods, often with traditional woven rush seats, and the woodwork left unpainted in order to celebrate the wood's natural grain, color, and luster. Beautifully crafted joints were left exposed to celebrate the handmade craftsmanship of the piece. This return to simplicity characterized many of the arts and crafts designs, and indeed a broader approach to life espoused by its practitioners. They sought to counter the excesses of Victorian culture, and interior decoration in particular, by suggesting that less is more. It would go on to shape artistic and social movements in America and Europe, more so than other movements of its time, such as the aesthetic movement and the more decorative Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau found its fullest flowering in France, but had its leading designers in Britain also, including Charles Rennie Mackintosh and Archibald Knox. Its swirling lines and the way motifs are elongated and abstracted can be distinguished from Arts and Crafts' more rectilinear design style and clean surfaces. Among the Arts and Crafts design principles espoused by Ruskin and Morris was a return to nature for design inspiration. Already in the Victorian period, a fascination with botany was fueled by the discoveries of new specimens arriving from around the world in Britain's far-flung empire. For example, Oxford University's Museum of Natural History opened in 1860 with its neo-Gothic design and celebration of natural motifs attributed by the architects Benjamin Woodward and Thomas Newenham Dean to the influence of John Ruskin. The inner court is surrounded by 30 columns on each floor, each constructed of a different British stone, and their capitals are topped by individually distinct carvings of botanical specimens. The stonemasons, the O'Shea brothers, worked from live plant specimens such as this pitcher plant, brought fresh to the worksite from Magdalen College's Botanical Gardens, itself the oldest botanical garden in England. The arts and crafts movement continued this kind of celebration of nature and its motifs, with many of the textiles, ceramics, and metalwork featuring trees and flowers from Britain's native hedgerows as a way to bring the beauty inherent in nature into the home. By reviving interest in the natural environment, the arts and crafts movement is often incorrectly misrepresented as rejecting mechanization. However, even William Morris, the acknowledged father of the arts and crafts movement, had machine looms in his workshops at Merton Abbey, using them when they reduced workers' tedium, and not when they might inhibit creativity. Indeed, it was more the larger social costs of industry that Morris opposed, declaring that he was not against machinery per se, but the great intangible machine of commercial tyranny, which oppresses the lives of all of us. In 1883, Morris joined the Democratic Federation, an early party in the British Socialist Movement, and over the next decade lectured at rallies and in support of workers' strikes around the country. Well, I think um, obviously Morris himself was um, really trying to make things better, life better for the working classes, and he really wanted a revolution to take place.
Morris was very um, struck by this, the poverty of this area when he came to live here in 1878. Although this stretch of riverside is very beautiful, surrounding it were really poor quality housing areas and slums. And uh, to the left of this house, Little Wapping was a terrible area with really poor quality housing and real areas of deprivation. And this really struck Morris. He'd always had a social conscience, but this really prompted him to do something about it. And he did say it was only his good luck of being born on this side of the window amongst beautiful books and works of art and not out there in the street amongst the poverty he could see. And so in 1883, he joined the Social Democratic Federation. Uh, afterwards, um, the Socialist League was born and the Hammersmith branch uh, was founded. And so this was the meeting hall of the Hammersmith Socialists. And they continued to meet here every Sunday evening throughout Morris's life. And he dedicated a huge amount of time and energy to the socialist cause, speaking many times locally in Hammersmith. One of his favourite spots was just down the road at the foot of Hammersmith Bridge. But of course he spoke up and down the country as well. And lots of famous people spoke here and came to watch and listen to the lectures. May Morris herself uh, used to supervise the library here, just above us, and Gustav Holst used to supervise the Socialist League Choir. So some really interesting people uh, that were here. And George Bernard Shaw was among the most prominent speakers after Morris himself. And his memoirs give a real tantalising glimpse into what it was like being a young socialist in those revolutionary days. Yeah, well, Morris himself um, influenced a wide